Welcome. In this data set, I look at historical returns across different asset classes. Now, let's say, what exactly are historical returns? Historical returns, put very simply, are the returns you'd have made over a past time period on any asset or asset class, last 10 years, the last 50 years, the last 100 years. Obviously, to compute these, you need data on what the asset class was priced at each year for those 50 or 80 or 100 years. Now, that, time, that historical return, therefore, requires that you specify how far back you want to go in time to compute the historical returns, and even how you want me to compute the returns. And you'll see in a minute what I mean by that. Now, you say, why would I care about what returns I've made over the last 10 or last 20 or the last 50 years? For two reasons. One is in performance evaluation. If you're a portfolio manager or even an investor looking at what your portfolio has done over the last 20 years, let's say it's made 15% a year. Before you pat yourself on the back for a job well done, you've got to look at what the market has done over that same period in that asset class. So if you invested entirely in stocks and you made 15%, the market made 20% on average over those, over those last 20 years, that's not a great return. You actually delivered less than you should have given your active investing. So one is for performance evaluation. There it's perfectly legitimate. The second, and this is more dicey, is when people use it to forecast what they will make in the future. So here's how it goes. You look at the last 20 years and you say, I've made 15% a year investing in stocks. And then you jump, you make a leap of faith. You say, if I made 15% a year for the last 20 years, I expect to make 15% a year going forward. Now you can see why it's dicey. You're forecasting that the future will look like the past and it might or it might not. So in this data set, I report historical returns and how you use it depends on you. Whether you want to use it for performance evaluation or forecasting, I will leave in your hands. So let's start by looking at the asset classes that I report data for in this data set. I first look at the S&P 500. Think of those as the historical returns on large cap U.S. equities going back all the way to 1928. So that's the first grouping. The second is I look at small cap U.S. equities, looking at the historical return of the bottom two deciles, the smallest companies in the, in the U.S. going back to 1928 as well. So look at the historical returns in the bottom two deciles. And that what stocks fall into those deciles will, will vary depending across the, the years. I also look at returns on U.S. Treasury bills. These are short-term three-month T-bills, the historical returns you'd have earned putting your money on those. I also look at returns on 10-year U.S. Treasury bonds, returns. Returns include both coupons and price appreciation. Incidentally, for equities, remember you can get returns from dividends as well as price appreciation. I look at, I look at both components. I also look at returns on, the, on corporate bonds, both at the highest rating. AAA and investment grade, BAA corporate bonds going back in time. For real estate, it's tricky because um, the, you don't have indices like you do with financial assets. I used Robert Schiller's date on housing prices prior to 1986, and he has the data set going back almost a century. And the Case Schiller index since then, where it actually is a reported index on real estate prices. Incidentally, these are the prices of real estate. They do not include rental income or other income you could have earned by holding the real estate. That's got to be factored into the comparison somewhere. Finally, I look at returns you'd have made by buying and selling gold at the start of each year and the end of each year. I use gold prices to compute these returns. There's a little bit more about returns. On returns and equity, both for the large cap and the small cap, I look at both dividends and price appreciation. For the dividends, I take the dividends paid over the course of the year and divide by the price at the start of the year. We repeat that again. For the index level was 4,500 at the start of the year and I got 450 in dividends during the course of the year. I take the 450 and divide by 4,500. That's my dividend year. Why do I use the price at the start of the year? Because I would have bought the stocks at the start of the year at that price and received the dividends over the course of the year. For the price return, I look at the price at the end of the year and the price at the start of the year. I take that difference and again divide by the price at the start of the year. My total return each year is the dividend yield and the price return. Now, price changes are, you know, are, are continuous. I can get them at every moment of every day. Dividends get updated only in discrete time. So as, a, as a, the price you see, so the returns you see for, for, the, for a year will reflect the actual price change during the year. 
but my dividends will be only through September 30th of the year. The last quarter's dividends are often not known. So I, I use the first three quarters actual dividends and use estimated dividends for the fourth, fourth quarter to get the returns on January 1st of any year. So that number might be slightly different from the actual return and I go back and fix it after I get the dividends. You know, the actual dividends later in the year, but at the time I reported, the fourth quarter dividends are an estimate. So I, I use that for both large cap and small cap stocks. For T-bills, my job is very simple. I look at the, the three month T-bill rate going back in time and that data set again exists for you know almost a century. And those T-bill rates are specified even though they're three month T-bills in annualized terms. So three, right now, for instance, the three, three month T-bill rate is might be 3%, but in effect, it's only you know, 3% of you uh, for, the, for the course of the whole year, in effect, you'll be getting 0.75% over the first three months. I take those annualized rates and because I'm reporting for the, for the year, I report the average of four three-month tables, the first quarter, the second quarter, the third. So that is what you'll see reported as my table return for a year is the average of the table rates for the four quarters of the year. Now, you would, you're in effect rolling the T-bill over three times into, you know, for the first quarter, the second quarter, the third and the fourth, and the average you see is what, what I report as a return for the year. There's no price risk here because it's entirely, you know, the, 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 the interest rate changing doesn't affect the level of the T-bill very much. So these are, these are easy to compute. On T-bonds, things are messier. Now I start with a coupon, which is pretty simple because I know it at the start of the year and I compute the coupon rate. So let's suppose the coupon rate right now is 2%. That becomes the coupon return you will make over the course of the year. But here things get dicey. If interest rates change during the course of the year, the price of your bond will also change, either up or down. That price return also has to be added. That price change has to be added to the coupon to compute the total return. So here's what I do to compute the bond return each year for both T-bonds and corporate bonds. I take the interest rate at the start of the year as my coupon rate. So let's say the interest rate at the start of the year is 2%. I make that my coupon rate for the year. I then look at the interest rate at the end of the year and I recompute what the bond price would be at the new interest rate. How do I do that? Well, remember, if my coupon rate is 2% and let's assume the, the bond price is 100, and the interest rate goes to 3%, the price of the bond has to be computed by taking the $2 coupon every year for the next 10 years, discounted back at 3%. So the present value of the coupons for the next 10 years, plus the present value of 100 at the new interest rate year. So each year what I do is I compute what the bond price will be based on the end of the year rate. But I try to keep the maturity fixed because that's the only way I can keep things from, you know, comparable across time. So my overall return the bond is going to be my coupon rate plus the bond price change as a percentage return, giving me a return on the bond. So in years in which interest rates go up, your bond prices will go down. So your, your return from the bond price change will be negative. And years in which the interest rate goes down, the bond price will go up. So that'll actually add to your coupon rate. As an example, in 2022, my, my interest rate at the start of the year was 1.51%. That became my coupon rate. But because interest rates went from 1.51% to 3.88% during the course of the year, the price of, a, of, of the bond dropped by about 20%. My return on bonds in 2022 was therefore almost minus 18 and a half percent, the highest negative number ever for a bond return. But bond returns include both coupons and price change. So the price change, the bond price calculation is just a standard bond price calculation. I keep it in an annual coupon, even though coupons might happen every six months because it doesn't make that much of a difference the price, but I just recompute the price at new interest rates. For the return on the housing, as I said, I just take the housing index value at the end of the year, housing index value at the start, and divide by the housing index value at the beginning. So it, it's a percentage change in the housing price. Now that might not be a fair assessment of returns and housing because it looks at only the price change component of housing. You're saying, what am I missing? Let's say you bought this house and you rented it out. You'd get rental income over the course of the year. 
similar to the dividend and the coupon income on a financial asset. So that is not being counted in here because there is really no easy way for me to bring in a rental income in, at least going back in time that far. So when you look at the returns in housing, recognize that I'm missing the cash income component of the return. For returns on gold, I take the gold price at the end of the year, the gold price at the beginning of the year, divide by the gold price at the beginning of the year. This is a recurring theme. The return is always based on the start of the year price, not an average price, not an end of the year price because I'm looking at the return over the course of the year. There is no cash flow from holding gold. It's all price change. A, a computational note, prior to 1971, gold prices were not, because we had a gold standard, gold prices didn't move much. It was, but since 1971, gold is a liquid and traded asset. I use the actual gold price to get the percentage return. So if you, if you notice lower volatility in gold prices, prior to 1971, it's because we operate in a very different system. Finally, all of the returns I compute are nominal returns. What does it mean? I take the price as given and basically compute and the dividends as given and compute my returns based on those numbers. And you say, what if there's inflation? Inflation obviously affects you. To adjust for inflation, I do also compute real returns. So if you have an 8% return on stocks and inflation is 3%, in effect, you're earning only 5%. The adjustment is a little messier because there's a compounding effect. So rather than just compare you know, 8 to 3, I should take 1.08 divided by 1.03 minus 1. I do that to compute a real return on all of the different asset classes. Final, uh, finally, I also compute, you know, once I've got the numbers for 50 or 80 or 100 years, I compute the averages. The first average I compute is a very simple arithmetic average. If I have 100 years of stock returns, I add the 100 years up, divide by 100, simple average. The other is a compounded average. What does that mean? I look at what a dollar I'd have invested at the start of the period would be worth today and what percentage return I'd have made. So let's say $100 invested 10 years ago is now 200. I take the 200, divide by the 100. I raise it to the power of one-tenth, right? Basically, it looks at the compounded return. What that will effectively do is give me a geometric average return, a compounded average. And you could argue that this is a much better measure of what you actually make rather than taking an arithmetic average across time. So I report both. So I hope you find this historic data set useful. And if you think of any other asset classes that could easily get added on, I will, with a, with, a, with a caveat. I want those asset classes to have a long historical time period. So if you're wondering why I don't have Bitcoin in here as one of my asset classes, first, I don't think it's an asset, but even if you argued it were an asset, I'm not going to have it for more than 15 years. This is a long-term historical return database. It's not an indicator what you will make in the future. It's an indicator what you'd have made in the past. And as I said, use it wisely. Your choice, it is your choice how you decide to use it. It's just data. I hope you found the session useful. Thank you very much for listening.